ligament is the strong fibrous connective tissue that connects bones to other bones. Ligaments support and stabilize all the different joints in your body. Ligament sprains, strains or tears are some of the most common types of injury in sport. In fact, ligament sprains and strains account for about 44% of all sport related injuries. The most frequently affected joint is the ankle. Nearly half of all ligament injuries are ankle sprains. This is followed by the knee, which makes up about a quarter of these injuries. Broadly speaking, when it comes to specific sports, American football, soccer, basketball and skiing are among the highest risk activities for ligament injuries. Female athletes also tend to have a higher risk of certain ligament injuries, particularly of the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL. Studies have shown that female athletes actually have a two to eight time greater risk of suffering an ACL injury compared to their male counterparts in similar sports, for example. This is an important point and leads in to the concept of risk factors. A risk factor, as the name suggests, is anything that increases your risk for ligament injury. Understanding the risk factors for ligament injuries in sport is really important for both prevention and rehabilitation. Risk factors are multifactorial, but are broadly divided into intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Intrinsic risk factors include things like having a prior ligament injury. Athletes who have a previously sustained a ligament injury have a two to tenfold increased risk of a similar injury in the future. Age is another non-modifiable intrinsic risk factor. And I've already mentioned sex. Female athletes have a higher incidence of certain ligament injuries, especially injuries to the anterior cruciate ligament compared to males in similar sports. Then we have extrinsic risk factors, things that are external to the athlete. These can include the type of sport they are engaging in, their equipment, like their footwear, the surface they are playing on, or even the weather. As I mentioned before, sports that involve high impact movements, sudden direction changes, and jumping, such as football, basketball, and skiing, have a particularly high risk. We can't go into all the different kinds of risk factors because there are so many, and they vary depending on the specific ligament involved. But just know that when it comes to ligament injuries, healthcare professionals need to pay close attention to identifying and managing their specific risk factors, particularly the modifiable ones, because this is essential in reducing the incidence of ligament injury or re-injury in sport. In simple terms, ligaments comprise of dense connective tissues made primarily of collagen fibers. They link bones together across joints, providing mechanical stability, but ligaments are different to bones in that they possess a degree of elasticity that allows them to withstand tensile forces and return to their original shape once those forces are removed. Injury to a ligament occurs when the force applied to the ligamentous tissue exceeds its biomechanical threshold, and this leads to damage, damage which can range from mild stretching to partial or complete tearing. At a cellular level, ligament injury triggers a complex cascade of biological responses designed to repair the damaged tissue. The process broadly consists of three overlapping phases, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. The inflammatory phase starts straight after the injury and usually lasts for up to a week and involves the release of lots of signaling molecules and an influx of inflammatory cells to the injury site leading to certain cardinal signs which you're probably already familiar with. Things like pain, redness, heat, and swelling. The proliferative phase follows, and this involves the formation of new blood vessels and the production of collagen and other extracellular matrix components. This results in the formation of what's known as scar tissue, which, although it's weaker and disorganized in its alignment, at least in comparison to the original ligament tissue, it still provides initial stability to the injured joint. Finally, the remodeling phase lasts the longest. It can last from several months to years. During this phase, the initially disorganized collagen fibers in the scar tissue are gradually rearranged and cross-linked to improve the ligament's strength and function. Essentially, the scar tissue is reshaped to more closely resemble the original ligament tissue. And this is where rehabilitation exercises have an important role. We'll talk about that later. Classifying ligament injuries helps us to define their severity, to map out appropriate treatment strategies, and to predict prognosis. 
Clinically, ligament injuries are generally classified into grades based on the extent of damage to the ligament and the amount of joint instability it causes. Grade 1, or mild ligament injuries, happen when the ligament is stretched but not torn. The joint remains stable and the athlete typically experiences minimal pain and swelling with little to no loss of function. The healing time is usually short and the athlete can often return to sport with minimal intervention. Grade 2 or moderate ligament injuries involve a partial tear of the ligament. The athlete will usually experience moderate pain, swelling and tenderness at the injury site along with some loss of function and potentially some joint instability. Finally, we have grade three injuries, the most severe kind of ligament injuries. Grade three injuries involve a complete tear or rupture of the ligament and tend to result in significant joint instability. Pain, swelling and loss of function are usually severe and the athlete may be unable to bear weight on the affected joint. This type of injury typically necessitates a lengthy recovery period and may require surgical intervention, followed by an intensive rehabilitation program. It's worth noting that this classification primarily serves as a guide and there are actually a few other ways to classify injuries that we won't get into right now. All you need to know is that all of the classification systems serve to do is to create a clinical picture for treatment and prognosis. In reality, the clinical picture for a grade one, a grade two or a grade three ligament injury can still vary a lot and they overlap based on the specific ligament involved, the mechanism of injury, the presence of other injuries, and other individual factors. Diagnosing ligament injuries involves a comprehensive approach that takes into account the athlete's history, their symptoms, a physical examination, and in many cases, imaging studies. Overall, the objective in diagnosing ligament injuries is not only to identify the ligament, but also to understand the full extent of the injury. This is crucial as it has implications for management and prognosis. First, the healthcare professional will take an in-depth history of how the injury developed. Key aspects include the mechanism of injury, the onset and location of pain, whether the athlete heard any audible pop at the time of injury and whether they were able to continue activity after the injury. The healthcare professional will also be particularly interested in ascertaining any details about prior similar injuries and the athlete's conditioning and training practices, as those are potentially important risk factors, which we talked about before. The healthcare professional will also perform a physical examination of the athlete. This involves inspecting, palpating and stressing the ligament in different ways and evaluating the available range of motion at the affected joint. Ligament stress tests like the anterior drawer test for the anterior cruciate ligament or the Taylor tilt test for the ankle ligaments are good examples of special tests that the healthcare professional might perform to assess the integrity or involvement of these ligaments. Usually, a thorough clinical assessment is enough to diagnose many ligament injuries, but sometimes imaging studies can be used to confirm the diagnosis and help assess the severity of the injury. Standard radiographs, like x-rays, can exclude fractures and certain avulsion injuries, while more detailed imaging, like magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is often used to assess the extent of ligament damage and to identify associated injuries to the cartilage or other soft tissue structures. Ultimately, an accurate diagnosis is the cornerstone of effective treatment for ligament injuries, hence the importance that clinicians be methodical and thorough in their assessment to ensure that all the components of the injury are identified and addressed. Finally, we move on to the concepts underlying the treatment of ligament injuries. Depending on the stage of recovery, this can involve lots of different strategies. At the start, the overall principle is pretty simple. Focus on pain management and minimize swelling. But as recovery progresses, things get a little bit more complicated. The athlete will need to incorporate a re rehabilitation exercise program with strength, balance, agility, and eventually sport-specific drills before they can return to play. You could do a whole lecture on the treatment of ligament injuries alone. So what I'll focus on here is the simpler part of management in the acute stage of injury. The guiding principles for the acute management of ligament injuries are nicely summarized in the acronyms PRICE, POLICE and PEACE and LOVE. PRICE, or protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation, is used immediately after the injury 
Here, protection refers to shielding the injured ligament from further damage to the tissue, followed by gradual reintroduction of movement. Ice is applied for 15 to 20 minutes every two to three hours to manage pain and swelling. Compression helps control swelling and movement, while elevation aids in reducing swelling by improving venous return. Next, we have police. Police is essentially the same as price, except optimal loading, OL, is introduced to replace the rest part of price. This underlines the necessity of beginning controlled therapeutic movement and exercises to promote tissue healing and prevent muscle deconditioning as soon as 48 hours after injury, or as pain allows. Finally, we have peace and love, protection, elevation, avoid anti-inflammatories, compression education, load, optimism, vascularization, and exercise. This more recent approach to managing ligament injuries acknowledges the importance of both immediate and long-term actions in the recovery process. Avoid anti-inflammatories is advised as these medications can potentially delay healing in the early stages of injury. Education stresses the understanding of the condition, the projected healing timeline, and the importance of adherence to treatment protocols. In the subacute phase, load and exercise emphasize the need for gradually increasing activity to promote recovery. Optimism encourages a positive mindset to support recovery, while vascularization promotes activities that enhance blood flow to the injured area. I'll reiterate, the exact approach and timeline for these treatment concepts will depend on the specific ligament injured, the severity of the injury, and the athlete's level of activity. Price, police, and then peace and love are just general guides. They don't give any information about the specific balance, strength, and sport-specific drills that should be completed to achieve full recovery. Like I said, we don't have the time to go into these here, but these general guidelines are a good start. <laughs>